Hey, Congressman. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I feel like last time we talked, you were not yet a congressman. We weren't. And I don't think you were a mother. (laughs) (laughs) That's Congressman Maxwell Frost, the first Gen Z member of Congress. He's in the middle of his freshman year as the youngest person serving in one of the oldest Congresses in history. I've been covering generational change in American politics for years now. And when Maxwell Frost won his seat in 2022, he brought Gen Z priorities to Congress for the first time. And that was big news. But Congressman Frost is more than just the new kid on the block. He's also the first Afro-Cuban to be elected to Congress. He's a former organizer for March for Our Lives, the Gen Z movement against gun violence. And his district includes parts of Orlando, a Democratic stronghold in a state with a Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, who's running for president. All this makes Maxwell Frost the perfect person to help us better understand this weird moment in American politics. In this episode, we talk about octogenarian politicians, dynamic young voters, how gun violence has radicalized an entire generation, and what it's really like to be in Congress in your 20s. I'm Charlotte Alter, Senior Correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. Congressman Frost spoke to me from his office on Capitol Hill. He was sitting in front of a massive painting with neon detailing and two stenciled portraits. So this art um, was made during the campaign trail by Manuel Oliver, lost to son Joaquin in the Parkland shooting. And, you know, he travels the world, really, and he does these walls. So this wall is one he made at one of my events. And I told him, I was like, look, when we win this thing, I'll put it up in my office. And so we won this thing, and here it is in the office. And so you did, yeah. So you're the youngest member of the third oldest Congress in history, uh, and you're the only member of Gen Z currently serving in Congress. Um. You and I have talked a lot about the importance of this generational perspective, how actually people form their political identity in response to the events that happen when they're young. So I've Mm -hmm. spent a lot of my journalism looking at what those are for millennials, and I've found that millennials have defined a lot of their political identity around 9-11, around the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, around the Great Recession, around Barack Obama's election, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, what was your moment like that? What was Gen Z's 9-11 moment? Has it happened yet? For Gen Z, I think it's hard to point out one. But usually when I speak with young people, and this is all anecdotal, right? But usually when I speak with young people, what I hear is Pulse, Parkland, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Right. right? It's just, it's like a lot of death and trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, incidents across the country that most Gen Z found out about via social media. Mm -hmm. And the thing about social media is when you find out about something, you know, you're not seeing it on the news and seeing like one talking head talk about it. You see it happen, then you're immediately thrusted into a world of opinions about it as well and sometimes Mm -hmm. actions. And I think that's a lot. And so, you you know, we're really And you participate in it yourself. And you can participate in it. And that's why you saw so many young people hit the streets after George Floyd was lynched in broad daylight or after somebody walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and murdered 17 people. And I think um, that trauma builds up in a generation and builds a sense of impatience because we don't, you know, want to get shot in school. And I think that's kind of helped create Gen Z into being at our current age, we're the most politically active generation um, in the history of our country right now. And half of this generation can't even vote yet. Yeah. And so I have a lot of uh, optimism for the future of the country. And I think this is part of the reason why we see the right wing really leaning into uh, abusing their power a bit more to assert dominance and kind of create a situation where minority rule is a thing, because I think they understand that time is not on their side. Because you have to think about it this way. You know, Gen Z, young millennials voted for Democrats. I think it was to the tune of 70% this past midterm. That's a big number. And here's the thing. Um, Older generations usually turn more conservative as they get older. We're not seeing that happen with younger millennials and Gen Z. Yeah. Well, this it's so funny that you're saying this. I wrote a whole book about exactly this because you are exactly right. 
And actually, you know, it is a little bit of a myth that people get more conservative as they age. Yeah, I mean, I think about myself. I'm literally the oldest a member of Gen Z can be. And I think about, you know, growing up, being like an elementary school, seeing a ton of people sleeping outside of Wall Street, asking my parents what it's about and hearing about wealth inequality at a young age, continuing to grow up, you know, the campaigns. I mean, I think a lot of Gen Zers would probably talk about the campaign of Bernie Sanders in 2015, 2016 as a movement that put a lot of people into politics. You know, Bernie is probably... This is not to compare individuals, but more movements. Bernie is probably the kind of Obama of Gen Z, you know, just like a figure that's kind of thrusted you into politics. And Obama was that for me, too. But again, I'm older and so than most Gen Zers. So a lot of them probably don't remember Obama's campaign. I volunteered on it. Um, you continue to get older and you find out that somebody walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and murdered 17 people. And then you yourself in your school have these drills, you know, every month where you are preparing for someone to walk into your school and shoot you. And you continue to grow up and you continue to learn about the climate crisis. And then you see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez get elected in New York and you're inspired by that. And so I think all these very progressive social movements and political movements have really built off of one another to kind of create this politically active generation that we see now. And I always like to tell people too, you know, there are a lot of issues that are uniquely American, gun violence, et cetera, but young people voting is actually a global issue. And if you look at hmm. the numbers, the United States has some of the most active young people in politics in the entire world. That's and interesting. I think you know, I was just in, not just, but a few months ago, I went on a congressional delegation to Japan and Korea. And the thing that a lot of the adults and young people would ask me about is how do we get our young people involved? Yeah. I mean, you know, one thing that I think is interesting about that that I noticed recently is one of the things that multiple studies have shown is that essentially voting is a habit and mm -hmm. that the reason older generations tend to vote in higher numbers is because they've developed the habit of voting. Voting is, yep. you know, baked into their life. They know where to go. They're registered already. They don't have to, yep. you know, do paperwork. It's like just like a, a thing that they do like their taxes or something. Exactly. But one thing that is unusual about this period that we're living in is that young people are building this habit a lot earlier and a lot stronger than older generations did. But younger generations are not represented in Congress anywhere close to their proportion in the voting population. So why is that? Why is government so old? Well, there's just institutional barriers to young people being able to get involved in the process. Now, you know, the first only Gen Z are in Congress. I'm also the oldest a Gen Zer can be. And so we just got old enough to run for Congress. But th there's the same question with local offices too, right? We don't really make up a good amount of local office. And I think um, those institutional barriers are a huge part in the fact that, you know, it's difficult to run for office. It takes money to run for office. And I think the more accessible we can make seeking office, the more we'll get not just young people, but new people. And that's something I always like to talk about that. You know, it's not about wiping out everybody in office and just replacing them with a bunch of Gen Zers or millennials, but it's about having a Congress and, you know, leaders in the country that reflect the people. And part of that is just having new people. Florida, not too long ago, was a pretty solidly purple state and it was a swing state. And now it is like hardcore a red state. And then there are a lot of other states that have gone in the opposite direction. Michigan used to be a fairly purple swing state. Now it's a pretty solidly blue state. Why has Florida swung so hard to the right? Well, I wouldn't say it's a hard right state. I mean, look, every election before that statewide hasn't been won by points. It's been won by under a point, right? right. And so that shows, even though typically the Republican would eke out the win, that's still a purple state, right? The way I like to describe it is Florida's really a case study in the difference between politics hmm. and policy. What do you mean by that? In terms of policy, you ask a Floridian about certain policy, they don't like permitless carry. They don't like the book banning. They like progressive policies. But when you get to the politics, that's where the water gets muddied and that's where people like Ron DeSantis can thrive. So 
Have you spoken privately to DeSantis at all? Like, have you met him? No, I've never spoken privately to him. I have never, like, met him, but I've been in his vicinity twice. The first time was during lockdown where he was doing a press conference at a vaccination site, and we went and interrupted to just talk about the fact Mm -hmm. that so many Floridians had died from COVID. The second time was he came to a venue where a singer, Christina Grimmie, was shot that is in the Belk District of Orlando, which is like a kind of like one of Orlando's gayborhoods per se. And uh, he came there for a private event. So we went and disrupted that too. And, you know, that's that video of me saying like, hey, we're dying. Floridians are dying. What's your plan to end gun violence? And he yelled and he said, nobody wants to hear from you. <laughs> so those were my two interactions with the governor. Um, I have had to sit down with him, but I'm open to it. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of just what your life is like. <laughs> As a guy in your 20s in an institution full of people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, I mean, what's your living situation right now? Did you find an apartment? I remember when you first got to Washington, you were having a lot of trouble finding an apartment. Yeah. Like a lot of people in their 20s do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) No, I do have a place. It took some time, but I I did get a place to live, thank God. And, you know, I think I've always been the youngest person on the team. Um, Hmm. growing up, you know, I started field organizing right out of high school at 18, worked on like five or six special elections in like a two and a half year time span, went to work at the ACLU and then March for Our Lives. March for Our Lives was like the first job where I was managing people younger than me. Hmm. And I was like 23 or something like that. How did you get involved in March for Our Lives? It was like the second day after the shooting, I DM'd the Parkland shooting. I was not at Parkland. But I saw what happened. And when that shooting happened, I had already been involved in the gun violence movement Mm -hmm. for, you know, years. So I DM'd all the students that I saw giving interviews on TV, on Twitter. And I was like, hey, I'm an organizer. I produce music events in Orlando. I'm a gun violence prevention advocate. And if there's anything I can do to help out, let me know. And one of them actually DM'd me back like at 8 p.m. or something and was like, hey, if you want to come over now we're like strategizing. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, I'm in Orlando. Like it would take four hours or whatever to get to Parkland. And then they DM me back and they were like, oh, we'll still be here. And I was like, okay. So I packed (laughs) it back and I drove to Parkland. I got there at like 1 a.m. or something. Wow. And the whole house was full of just like, you know, all the students from Parkland organizing. And that's when I first got plugged into it. And, And then, you know, a few years down the road, I became their organizing director. So one question I have for you, as somebody who's been so involved in activism, how has your view of activism changed now that you're on the inside? And now that you are yourself a member of Congress, you have some real power. Yeah. Um, what have you now learned about what— I, Yeah, like n- now, now that you're the man, <laughs> um, what have yeah. you learned about what types of activism work and what types don't work? Um, It hasn't really changed anything. It's just kind of solidified my belief in these tactics. And, you know, you become a member of Congress and you're, you know, you see people get protested or this and that. And, you know, you're just like, well, you know, you don't want that to happen to you. (laughs) You know what I mean? And like, and then you're like, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, this does work because the pressure is important. And so it honestly hasn't changed the way I think about advocacy or anything. It just made me go, huh. Yeah, that is a good tactic. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, man, yeah, Yeah. that would suck. And that's the purpose of direct action is it's not supposed to be pleasant. And um, and I think it's important to know that. I guess one thing I have learned, though, well, not learned, but solidified is there's a ladder of engagement here, right? There's like a timeline. And I think oftentimes people are quick to get to the end of that timeline, Mm -hmm. which is actually direct action. And there's so many steps that you want to take beforehand that help put you in a good position to justify the direct action. But on top of that, help with the story of the movement. And the story of the movement is so important um, because I think it really, you know, shows just how you got to where you're going. And so like if you're engaging with an elected and you want them to do something, building that relationship with them and their staff is really important. And if you get to a point where you feel like I'm being ignored or we're not getting where we want to go, then, 
you turn on the direct action and then there's more power in that because you have a history and a story of interacting with the person. But then there's also times and movements where you have to just go there immediately. And when you see someone lynched on Twitter or you see, you know, 20 people get murdered in a school or something, then that's when you sometimes have to skip a little further ahead in that. When we come back, more from Congressman Frost about what it's like to be a member of Congress when you're only 26. So what's your social life like as a member of Congress? Like, can you date? Are you dating anyone? Well, I have a partner. We've been together for like four years. Actually, when I got here, a lot of members who are single were like, do you have a partner? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, cool. Because if you come in single, it's harder to like date as a member than just already come in with a partner that you know and trust and love and stuff. So I was like, awesome. Um, But the arts and like my friends and the things I like to do are very important to me. And this is a very stressful job. Um, And honestly, I'm still figuring out what sustainability looks like in this job. Mm -hmm. I don't have it figured out just yet. Um, The days I take off are pretty ad hoc and random and less of like a structure that I believe in and I know works and is good for me and my soul. And so I'm still figuring that out. But, you know, I try to go to a lot of concerts. You know, the good thing is, my love of concerts has been less interrupted because, you know, concerts are in the evening. And so right. you can work a whole day and go to a show and not feel like you're missing out on work or anything like that. And so I yeah. go to a lot of shows here in D.C. I go to a lot of shows in Orlando. And right. I find ways to incorporate music in the work that we do here in the office. And, you know, part of a role I want to play is getting artists local and national engaged in the work right. that we're doing. How do you find ground with older colleagues who have very different politics than you? I mean, do you think that there are fundamentally different priorities between different generations of politicians? Um, It depends how zoomed out you are, right? Like, I think generally we all want very similar things, right? We want safety and security for our people, opportunity for our people. We want to bring home money from the district. We want to pass good policy. People want to, you know, see their colleagues and themselves reelected so we can grow the team and continue to do good stuff for the American people. Yes. Now, I think your generation and where you're from and who you are and your family story and your experiences, all these things change the lens through in which you see the same issues. So if you were to talk to me about economic opportunity, I might talk to you a little bit more about student debt, debt, food insecurity, housing, and becoming an entrepreneur and building wealth. And an older person might have a different way of thinking. They might first want to talk about home ownership, Mm -hmm. right? And like, there might be other things they want to talk Mm. about. But for me, as a young person experiencing what, you know, it is to grow up in this country firsthand, I understand that, you know, home ownership is very important, but damn, we can't even get into a rental. And so I'm thinking about how can we make renting easier for people so then we can build wealth to get a house. And see, those are different lenses. Um, And it's not that I don't want to talk about buying a house. It's that I just realized that there's steps to getting there. And the first step is having a place to live in the first place. And that's personal for me. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm curious, you know, what has your own experience with student debt been? Because you left college, right? Yeah, I don't have student debt um, because, number one, I went to Valencia College in Central Florida, which is more of like a community college. Um, And then when I was almost done with my degree, I paused because I got hired at the ACLU and was working a lot and my grades started to suffer and I was like, something's going to have to give and it's not going to be the ACLU. So I, so I paused my college and then I was like, I'll go back and finish. And then I started working at March for our lives. And so at that point I was like, I can't start right now. Yeah. And then I started running for office and did that for a year and a half. And I'm a member of Congress. So I will finish at some point, but I don't have student debt because I just paid off my classes as I went. Okay, who is your best friend in Congress? And who is your best friend in Congress 
who's very different from you? I can't give you one name. Why not? Um, I can't do it. There's okay, too many. Okay, can you just tell me about some of the people I can that give you've you a few names. To? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think first off, there's like our whole freshman class is very close mm-hmm. um, for the most part. You know, we want to see each other grow and we hang out a lot. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, Greg Gassad from Texas or Summer Lee, Delia Ramirez, Robert Garcia, Morgan McGarvey, Becca Ballant. Like, there are so many of us who have similar politics and those people are really important to me. Um, and then there's also members who have been here for a few years who share similar politics. You know, I had a natural, like, connection with like a vibe. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I think um, she's someone that, you know, I tend to, like, hang out with and talk with a lot and seek advice from. She's also my mentor in the Progressive Caucus, too. What's the best piece of advice she's given you? She's given me a lot. When we first met, the advice she gave me was more like practical because, you know, I like what? was becoming known for not being able to afford an apartment and stuff. And honestly, a lot of the practical advice she gave me on like, you know, <laughs> banking and, you know, if you need a loan or if you need this or places to look for housing and stuff like that, that was actually really helpful for me. But I'll say like the general thing that I really get from her advice wise, it's really helpful. It's just being able to navigate this space as a young progressive and figuring Mm. out what that means for you and what that means back home. I'm in Black Caucus and Hispanic Caucus, and that wasn't always a thing. And there were people before me who kind of went through a ringer to make that happen. And now future Afro-Latinos are going to be able to do that because other people who came before us kind of, you know, challenged that and made it happen. So there's a lot of people here who I look up to because of who they are, but because of what they've done in the institution. Now it's time for our final round of questions, the last segment of our interview called The Last Time. Okay. Okay. When was the last time you did karaoke? And what did you sing? Oh, God. Um, It was, like, during the campaign, maybe, like, July or August. We went late night to Rising Star in Orlando, Florida, which is a karaoke bar with a full stage, like a venue. Wow. And you get a full band with backup singers, lights, and smoke. It's like, if you like to sing in the shower, it's your dream because you're literally on a stage. I did September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. I love that song. And, uh, And I killed it. And I killed I'm it. I'm sure you it did. It was really good. And I'm not a big karaoke guy, to be honest. Okay, when's the last time you bought a vinyl record? The last record I bought was, I'm actually looking at it. I was on um, Record Store Day. I did a tour of like five record stores in my district. And when I was at the first one, I was like, hmm, should I buy one at each stop? And I, you know, I can't use like my congressional budget or my campaign. You know, I was like, yeah. that's going to be a lot of money today, but whatever. So I, bu- I personally bought one at each store. So I bought... Um, MF Doom. I bought a mass production record at another record store. I bought Paramore's This Is Why at another record store. And I forgot the last one I bought. Oh, I bought a Cat Stevens record, which is like his first ever record he ever made before he really got signed. And Mm -hmm. it's like super poppy music. Sounds a little different than than him. Wow. You know, that we're used to. It was really cool. Um, When's the last time you cooked something? Ooh. And I love to cook, but I don't even remember the last time I cooked. I'm spending too much money going out. Part of it is I don't have time to cook here. Also, I love my apartment, but my kitchen's a little weird. So it's like, I don't like to cook in it. And then when I'm back home. No, I did cook recently. I cooked like two weeks ago. I made risotto. Nice. Sounds good. Yeah. I like making risotto. It's fun. It's therapeutic. (laughs) When's the last time you fell down a TikTok rabbit hole? This morning. <laughs> what was it? Um, I mean, you know, I think I was just looking on my For You page, but the night before, I got, there's a guy in Florida, and he goes into Everglades barefoot, and like, in the middle of the night, and takes TikToks of like, just he's like right next to gators, and he like grabs frogs and snakes, and it's just... 
so freaking crazy and insane and it's just really entertaining you know just him walking around the everglades barefoot oh my god you know i mean it's just wild wow it's peak florida man i (laughs) i have a lot of respect for it to be honest okay last one when was the last time you pulled an all-nighter an (laughs) all-nighter last week um i went to a concert here in dc and then had some friends in town I hadn't seen in a while. I hung out with them. And then I had an interview here in the office very early. I was doing a morning show in Orlando remotely. And so I just kind of stayed up. Wow. Yeah, I came to the office very early at like five. And I took a nap on this couch. And then I did the interview. Wow. Well, yeah. I feel like probably Gen Z members of Congress are able to do that a little better than some of the boomers might be able to do. Yeah, it definitely sucked, you know, would not recommend. Um, But, you know, it is what it is. I Uber Eats some McGriddles and I got through (laughs) the day. Well, Congressman, I really appreciate you making time to speak with me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. You can find Representative Frost on Instagram and Twitter at MaxwellFrostFL and on TikTok at RepMaxwellFrost. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really love to hear from you. So send your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Cedric Wilson. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Trigger 23. At Time, our executive producers are Mike Beck and Sam Jacobs. At Trigger 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs>